Thanks for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Mel. Uh, I um, am in the position of diverting you from seeing the amazing work to um, begin this discussion, and I kind of feel torn about it. It is an incredible show, so I feel very fortunate to be here in person with the work. Um, I thought to begin this conversation with the question of exactly what sculpture is, which is, in fact, like so many things that should be clear, not a, not a self-answering um, proposition. Um, Mel staked his, um, staked his place in the art world from the beginning on being, um, being quizzical about what sculpture is. Um, he talks about um, entering the art world at a time where putting sculpture on a pedestal was an extremely radical thing to do. Sculpture had to be on the floor. I know there are people in this room who remember that. A pedestal was not something that was considered conceivable. Um, and, you know, so being a sculptor, when you began, was like kind of making a statement. Um, but then you told um, Adam Weinberg more recently that sculpture is kind of limiting. And uh, these are things that um, were said in the catalog. Um, and then um, Carol Dunham, that it's... Um, it's been more, that, that sculpture as a discipline has been more thoroughly dismantled even than painting, which has been pretty thoroughly torn apart. Um, so I wonder if you'd like to begin by um, updating well, this I'll, question. <coughs> I'll give it a try. Uh, but you just point out, yes, I'm full of contradictions there. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and also, thank you very much, Nancy, for coming here. I, I was so pleased when you wrote the essay for the book, and I'm so proud of the book, and I think that that was, was really fantastic. So nice to see, I think the first time you've seen the show is today, so uh, that's great. Um, the, uh, did I decide to be a sculptor? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I sort of joke that I started with photography because uh, I liked it because it took no talent. Uh, you know, you just, just do it. And uh, so I sort of uh, somehow moved that into, you know, object making, sculpture, uh, because I, I, you know, I never really studied or rendered things. I still don't do preliminary drawings of any sort. Uh, so I've always been very connected to the material uh, that I'm using. and. Uh, so, yes, I mean, sculpture, I'm just thinking to myself, that was, I went to college, I thought I was going to be a math major, uh, and they're just having a lot more fun down in the sculpture department. <laughs> you can play, you, you play music when you make things, and you can talk, and you can see what other people are doing. It's actually, I, I know I'm talking about the school part, but it's very competitive, uh, and that sort of keeps you going. You see what people are doing, you, you know, want to do something better, and, uh, so it was a community dialogue that just didn't exist in any other studies that I looked into or thought about. Um, but when I came to New York, uh, yeah, I mean, sculpture, painting was supposedly dead, uh, but sculpture was on a, uh, a path of uh, sort of diminishing returns, I think. Uh, and I think that really it was the end of the, uh, I'd say the, the modernist era, I mean, uh, and you know, the sort of, that art history as we learned it was a straight line, you know, basically uh, from Impressionism right up to minimal art or something. Uh, and I don't know why, but I just was thinking recently, and maybe you know the book, but the, the idea, I love the title of it, Susie Gab looked at it, Is There Progress in Art? because it seemed to me in the 70s that if somebody uh, you know, built something or uh, it was gonna be a cube or the next time it was gonna be you know, sawdust on the floor or it, each thing was meant to be another step in this sort of prog pro progression. And uh, so as an artist in the 70s, I was trying to figure out exactly what could I do 
basically how could I fit into this narrative. So I was very conscious of what was going on. And of course, I started out studying with uh, Robert Morris and Tony Smith and then working for Dorothea Rockburn and all the, uh, so this was a conversation that was going on all around me. And uh, so I basically found myself right in the middle of it. Uh, but, you know, I made a lot of things that never saw the light of day, obviously. <laughs> yeah. that's, the, that, that's what happens early, middle, and late, right? <laughs> right. You know, there, there continue to be paths not taken. Um, and, yeah, painting, not a path taken. But, of, of course, your sculpture is often talked about, including by you, as actually being a form of drawing. And, you know, th there's this... Um, description that comes into it from time to time of using a chainsaw, um, which is, um, I think, partly <laughs> I, I, a figure I love, of speech. I love that quote. I've said that before. Whoever said that yeah. uses a, a, a chainsaw, chainsaw is like a very big pencil. pencil. Yeah. Um, but, but there is an aspect of your work that, um, because it's so, so um, fundamentally based on slicing things open and putting them back together and tracing that, you know, not quite continuous line from inside to outside. Um, do you want to expand a little bit on how you feel the drawing, um, sculpting, and also, as we see in, in this show, pretty much for the first time, photography um, and other works on paper, how those, me how those mediums all feed each other, because I know you don't make sculpture from drawings. That's the one yeah. thing you don't do. Well, yeah, I mean, drawing is just, it depends how you define it, um, but we came through an era where drawing became more important. Uh, I would say in previous eras, centuries, you'd look at the final work and the preliminary sketches were just that. But uh, for some reason, as the conceptual art and minimal art was going on, there was also interest in drawings and drawings uh, are incredibly personal. Um, because they're your thoughts, uh, you know, almost, or maybe the doodles you, when you're on the telephone. I mean, what, what you, they're, they're direct, almost maybe even subconscious in some way. But I take drawing on as a uh, linear narrative. Uh, that's the way I've, you do something, you react to it, you do something else. If you're doing a drawing and you erase it, uh, you never really erase it because there's still evidence of it in the paper. And that is sort of the way I began to use wood. So uh, if you do something, if you cut something apart, you can't put it back together, really. Uh, <clears throat> although I do all the time. Uh, but I mean, it's not like a steel where you can, uh, you know, weld it back together, grind it down, or, you know, bronze, you can meld it. You know, so many different ways where the material uh, you know, can work for you, but with wood, it's, uh, it kind of controls you a little. Uh, so that uh, all those things, the grain, the, the cuts, everything, everything is potentially evident. And uh, you know, I've talked a lot about <laughs> mistakes, that there are no mistakes because you can just go back and fix them, uh, you know, glue things back together. And I, I just think that that, um, sort of loose way of working uh, reminds me more of drawing in that way of you know, drawing, erasing, you know, using a ruler, not using a ruler. I mean, there, there's so many things that you do. Uh, and, and I think that that is something. In fact, one show in the early 70s, I did the first show of very small pieces and I called them wood drawings because that is how I was thinking. That's how I was working uh, directly. And talking about the work that way um, makes me think of another element of your work, which has to do with its, I'm going to say time-based quality, you know, that you've talked about the work being sort of happenstance, um, circumstantially caught in a moment of time, that it could always go forward another step or two, that we're catching it sort of in motion, sort of a freeze frame of um, a very complicated process, which we're invited to see, right? We're invited well, to Well, I like the use of freeze frame. I, I like that because uh, that, that is kind of, it could go on, but 
In other words, you can't really finish anything, or it's, you don't want to finish anything because you want to stop when there are still questions opening. And in my mind, when I talk about the linear nature of the way I make things, you move on and do it in another piece uh, and you know, keep going that way. But uh, yeah, it is, it's definitely, there's a, there's a time element and one thing you know, follows the other. Uh, there's also the simultaneity of having many things around you in the studio at the same time um, and responding to something you've already done and thinking about what you, you might do. Um, yeah, a moment in time. <laughs> I, we were talking in the gallery just now about um, the relationships among the work and of course so much of the work is about the internal relationships taking, you know, the removals, taking something out of what becomes the base and making it the top or taking, you know, something out of um, a, a chunk of wood, a block of wood and repositioning it, um, of coring a log or a, another kind of um, wood source. And um, so I wonder if you want to talk about the relationship between um, those kinds of internal uh, connections and the connections among the pieces in the exhibition. In other words, is it an installation or is it, you know, an assortment of independent objects? And well, I, I, would, I would definitely say it's independent objects, but this whole question of installation is something I spend a lot of time with because it's kind of like the final stage in making the object is, you know, uh, there's so many tweaks and twists, you know, like putting together a show like this of, uh, that um, I, you know, I say the, inst the installation is important, but I don't call it an installation because an installation is a whole nother realm of non-objective artwork. Uh, and I'm definitely making objects, but what I'm working with is the conversation between them. Uh, and that happens in the studio you know, it changes a little when you go out in the world. Uh, and I sort of think that in terms of sculptors and studios, I mean, you just have to look at Brancusi and how much of his work he kept around because it was a conversation going on in his studio uh, and he'd make pieces uh, and put them on different bases and try this out and try that out. And uh, as I understand it, if he sold something he didn't want to let go of, he cast it in plaster. So it's an ongoing back and forth that I think is very important. I don't know that this happens in painting, but certainly uh, you're setting up a dialogue between things in the studio, and this, a show like this gives me the opportunity to continue that outside the studio. But it is funny because a Brancusi, it's almost like taken from the studio at one moment with the base it happened to be sitting on that moment, and suddenly that's art history. <laughs> Um, because it it's almost sometimes seems random, you know, as he's moving things around. Yeah, the, the, his, you know, his, his use of bases, his making the bases into a freestanding form of sculpture, which of course Scott Burton organized a whole show around at the Museum of Modern. Yeah, that was you know, a great, like, great concept. Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, so many things that Brancusi um, pioneered remain a, a part of the vocabulary. Um, similarly, the use of photography, you know, the way he reconfigured his work as image by making his own um, photographs, which is not what you do with the photographs. Do you want to talk a little bit about the photographs since they're um, new? Yes, I, uh, I did, as I said, I started out doing photography really in high school, uh, but I had the opportunity to work with four by five uh, sheet film, four by five cameras, and uh, I liked the whole process which I guess is a word, first time you use it tonight, but process is <laughs> a big, big thing. Uh, that, um, you know, you have the, you put the hood over your head, what you're looking through is upside down. So you're, you know, sort of thinking about it that way and then, you know, we develop it. And uh, so I was very interested. I always liked the four by five camera because it's, I mean, nowadays we can't even imagine it because uh, somebody says, can I take your picture? And then they take 10. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a whole different thing if you're going to say this is the picture I want and decide that that's it. 
so I had an old 4x5 camera that actually it turns out that my great grandmother had a dark room. I just found that out recently. <laughs> yeah, my great grandmother had a dark room in Maine and she did things and nobody talked about it. I don't think anybody thought she was doing anything. I mean, you don't hear records of it. You don't, but yes, that was her thing and she took pictures of rooms in the house. So it was only interesting to see that it's maybe a desk is in the same place it was 120 years ago. But uh, I, I, the thing is, is, I found these cameras in the attic and that's what started me with a four by five again. So, uh, and then I took some pictures of my own work which became announcement photos uh, and uh, with these old cameras. And, uh, but then more recently, uh, and this work is all done with a Polaroid Backs, which is the uh, you know four by five Polaroid pack that goes on the four by five camera, so it would give me the negative and the positive. And uh, it's interesting because when I fixed up my last loft, I had it all plumbed for a dark room, which was made ridiculous in about two years. <laughs> so I never never made the dark room, but this Polaroid film uh, was really interesting to me, and it. Again, I don't know why, but as I see, look at this, why am I always going this positive, negative thing? You know, this, it seems like I'm always flipping back and forth, but definitely the negative <coughs> that Polaroid, this Polaroid camera made much more information in it than the actual print that came from it. And that's what I focused on. So these photographs here are just photographs of my own work in the studio. Uh, but the negative was scanned as a positive. And they were four by five inches, and these are four by five feet. And I just sort of like that sort of connection. There are so, so many. I mean, there's, there's such a wealth of connections. It's, it's sort of dizzying, and, and so many um, complications in each work to puzzle through. I'm thinking about the twin sculpt, mm -hmm. sculptures where the, you know, there's a positive that becomes um, the, the basis for a cast that's done in, um, most of them are done in cast rubber. Um, so the, you know, this is sort of a very 80s question, you know, what, what's the original, you know, where, where's the, um, what sta status does the re reproduction have? Um, but it, it has a very close link to, you know, making the negative into a positive. Um, and also, um, playing with um, questions of scale. So one thing that, of course, you only see when you're in the show as opposed to, you know, spending time with catalog or, you know, even trying to remember pieces you've seen is all of the different scales and the disparities of scale that take place in um, one room. So I want to talk at all about scale. I, I, I was told once in the 70s, and I sort of took it to be true, that scale is not an idea. Uh, in other words, that, you know, that this little joke, you, you make it, this is not good, you make it bigger, if it's still not good, you cast it in bronze. <laughs> you know, that there, there are these different things that, that would, you know, give something some feeling of, of strength. Uh, what happened to me uh, after I did in the show, there's this, I just keep referring to as the spider piece. The black and white piece was 1982, the uh, Nemo. Uh, and that is the, the culmination of what I was doing in the 70s, uh, which were linear, usually more architecturally oriented uh, sculptures. Uh, but uh, it that's, was very complicated to do. And as I said before, I sort of, cannibalized part of it and I started making small objects and just looking at them and I began to realize how powerful they were. Uh, and this, you know, goes back to, uh, you know, Picasso, Glass of Absinthe or something. I mean, a sculpture, I felt, doesn't need to be big to be powerful. Uh, it just, well, it needs, needs to be what it is. So scale was a really important thing kind of in the reverse of me going very small so that uh, it almost limited what I could do with each piece. And that, of course, led into, well, what do you do with these small objects? And then I you know, went back to these bases that uh, I constructed or had constructed so that the viewer was connected to the ground and the sculpture was up here sort of in the 
cerebral area. And uh, I felt that they were pretty scale-less, uh, you know, and I did not make them as maquettes. I just, they were sculptures. They are sculptures. It happened that some of them I did decide to make bigger. So, I mean, I'm susceptible to the power of scale, too. <laughs> I mean, I, the thing they did in this show, putting that large red-yellow-blue piece in the same room as the pieces I'm talking about, uh, was really uh, exciting to me to kind of play with the scale that way. But I actually, in this show, more than the Addison, or more than any other show I've had, scale seems to be a big issue. Uh, not an issue, but it's something uh, that I felt seeing the work is coming out as more monumental than I imagined. And that's kind of exciting. I, mean, I knew what the concrete pieces were going to be monumental. They are planned that way. But, uh, it's, uh, I'm surprised I've made so many big sculptures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and, and this is the space for them. Yes. I, I mean, it, you know, they, they live very comfortably in the space. Um, so, you know, there are a bunch of different scales going on here. Um, some feel like um, thoughts that are, you know, going to be realized in, in more, you know, fully materialized ways. Um, not to say that one is negligible and the other is important, but you know you use the the term cerebral. Some seem to have um, the scale of trees, you know, that they hold on to that source material as a tree, and some seem quite deliberately um, the scale of people. And you know there is this question of anthropomorphism or um, a certain kind of um, humanness that comes into a certain amount of writing about your work and also some of the things you've said about eviscerating the trees and, you know, so... Well, you that's, know. that's what I, I realized that, you know, I don't do, you know, it's no, nothing representational, but then it occurred to me it's all about, you know, the body. Uh, and you mentioned Scott Burden, his, his chairs were about the body, the absence of the body, and I sort of think that these might be a stand-in without any specific references, uh, but the vulnerability uh, and the whole inside-outside, uh, the, the organic versus the geometric. I mean, there's, there's so many things in there, but the basic truth is that if you make something vertical, it's going to look more like a figure <laughs> than something horizontal will look more like a landscape. I mean, so all this stuff is going on. Uh, and I find it kind of amusing. Uh, I mean, a friend of mine who saw this show and the, liked the black oil pieces, he said, he said, sort of like they're saying, uh, come dance with me or I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, know, I thought that was funny, but I, 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 you know, I just, you know, they have legs, they have prosthetics. Uh, Everything uh, that I make in sculpture is about standing somehow until I move to the wall. So, you know, they're references. <laughs> yep. And yes, some of them are a little more menacing than others, and, yeah. are, and some are more embracing than others. And, and standing in the prosthetic that, you know, in the form of metal pipes or in the form of, you know, pieces of wood that are repositioned so they become feet. Um, are um, both expressing what wood needs to do to, you know, become a freestanding sculpture and also what it takes to stand up. Um, yeah, I was, I was just thinking because a lot of the way I get to these things is circum, whatever, it's, it's a roundabout way because a lot of these were formal decisions for me. I was very interested in uh, the Rockefeller wing uh, and looking at... Um, you know, oceanic art, different things, or even you could look at dinosaurs, and they all had these metal stands that held them up, but you weren't meant to see it. You're meant to look at the object and ignore what makes it stand, its presentation. So that was something I consciously thought of, and I thought, well, I, if I make it stand, it's going to be part of the sculpture. And that moved on into the, where I started taking part out and putting it on top, was that I was going to make a base, and I was going to take the sculpture from inside the base and put it on top. So, um, you know, it's just about allowing that all to be part 
of the work. It's, it's a formal decision, and it's yeah. also, I mean, you've talked about this too, in a sense, it's about content, you know, that there is something internal that, you know, is brought to the surface that... Um, is it possible that I just don't see content till later? <laughs> because, you know, that's what we're talking about, is, uh, and even when I came up with this idea that it's maybe the human condition, maybe these props, and you know, I, I didn't think of them that way. That's kind of coming back to look at them and kind of go, you know, of course I hear what other people say, but you know, also for myself is like um, those black oil ones, I mean, they, they've been through something and yet uh, I, it's, I really don't know what got me into that, making them that way, but that's, that's I can't ignore that now. Speaking of, black, of the black oil sculptures, do you want to talk at all about your use of color, your choice of color, and also how you use color to help articulate what's going on physically? Yeah. <clears throat> well, this is, again, very, everything's, I'm a very practical person. I, I come up with these ways of working. If I'm going to work with wood, I'm going to start with a piece of wood. Uh, and the way I've been doing it, because of the saws I use, uh, I don't chip away at it and wind up with wood chips on the floor. I cut parts out, and maybe later I put them in a different way. Uh, but this first object is, uh, could be a tree trunk with bark, or, or it could be a block of wood that I've made that we will just keep with the black oil once that I, uh, covered the surface with uh, raw linseed oil and lamp black. Um, and in the world of linseed oil, raw linseed oil is not meant to dry, or dries in three years or something. It's not something you, you use in painting. Um, but uh, that enabled me, when I cut into these pieces and started moving pieces around, that the very much like drawing, hand prints and everything became part of the sculpture because we're working with this sort of oily um, black thing. So, so that, that's the outside, you know, coming to the inside. But later on, I would just paint the blocks that I'd make. And I happened to have like this heavily pigmented uh, Japan oil color. It's a sign painter's paint. And, uh, you know, I just used the red, the green, the yellow, what, whatever know, came from the can, and that was the first thing I did. Then I cut into it, and from then on, you could see what was cut out, what was changed, and what was the original outside. And in the 70s, I moved into a, a loft on Duane Street. There was a tremendous amount of old wood shelving, and uh, of course, that became my material for a while. Uh, but the thing is, is that you'd cut into the wood shelving and it would be kind of bright yellow, be the fresh cut. I really like the fresh cut versus the old wood. Um, but somewhere along the line, I guess I'd done it enough so I realized that 10 years later, my fresh cuts looked like the old wood. So, <laughs> so that wasn't really you know, doing that. But anyway, I started painting things and using oil uh, you know, to sort of distinguish. Uh, the outer surface, which then turned up, maybe it's the inner surface somewhere else. It, it, it does help us read the work, and it also seems to me characteristic of your use of every material that comes into the sculpture, which is you get to the, you know, the most pigmented paint, or, you know, in the, in the paper pulp pieces, you know, the, the, there's pigment without binder, with, you know, and, and just as with the wood, it's, it's the most you know, true to, and I don't want to go to the, the truth to material um, chestnut, but it, you know, it's, it, it gets to every conceivable aspect of what it is um, to be a tree, which leads me sort of to two questions, which has to do with a whole new discussion that's cropped up in the past half a dozen years about the social life of trees. But before we get there, um, <laughs> I, I, I'd, um, what you were just saying about you know using things that are you know that are on hand that are in the studio and um, and I think of your work as as having a lot to do with with parsimony with economy you know that nothing is wasted, which um, is kind of a Yankee thing and kind of a 
boat building thing, which you've talked about. Okay, so here's what I really want to ask. Can you talk a little bit about this boat that your mother built? I've always been curious. <laughs> what was this built in boat, and how did she yeah. build it? No, no, it wasn't that big a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Answer. It wasn't that big a Other deal. I think you know you get the plans and you get the material. She made a dinghy, a pram, as it's called, square ended, and you know, but she had to glue down the plywood and you know, have waterproof joints and everything and. Uh, I actually, you know, I was very young. I didn't pay much attention to it. Uh, her older sister had built a speedboat, which was much more interesting. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I didn't think this dinghy was much, but anyway, but it, I, it's a great line. But she did build it, and uh, it did. We're still using it. Really? So, yeah. Oh. <laughs> but there's there's an economy, and you know, in in the way boats serve outfitted, the way boats are built, you know, a, a determination to have it work, right? Yeah. You know, which is, I think, it, you know, some key part of, of your process. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the parsimony, I, I, yeah, New England, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't know why, when, or how, but I got into the idea that I was using every part, and it was not like an ecological concern, although it could be, you know, that's great if there's no waste. Uh, if I found out a way to work without wasting anything, uh, you know, repurposing every part of it. And you mentioned something about you know things in the, in the studio. Another thing that I always felt uh, is that there's no reason to not be able to work. In other words, I've known people, artists who have these great ideas, but they need funding so they can get all this, you know, whatever film made, you know, there, there's so many obstacles to making art. And my feeling was, uh, no, you just have to decide to do it. Uh, so that, you know, picking up things, repurposing things, uh, uh, using what's in front of you, even if it's inferior or it's not what you thought you wanted, uh, I think is much more constructive than uh, thinking about what you don't have and what you need. So that's, that's kind of, part of it too. And you know, going back in a not completely facetious way to um, thinking about trees and thinking about, um, about their relationships among each other, um, it's one of those things that has really fundamentally changed over the course of your career and um, I wonder if that has played into your thinking about your materials I'm not quite quite sure what what's what's changed about trees except that we're worried about losing them is that <laughs> what, what are you referring well to I'm just referring to you know the, the discussions that have been taking place about trees communicating with each other trees mm -hmm. helping each other out trees you know trying to support each other and defend each other yeah. against I'm not, I'm not very nice to trees <laughs> that sure you are. It worries me. I can't follow that. <laughs> no, you, you, you salvage the ones that are, you yes, know, that I do. are I almost save them. I save them. Yes, I give them. Right. I mean, a lot of those big trunks were hollow trees that were eaten by insects, and I just collected them and uh, reworked them because I thought they were such amazing, beautiful objects. And, uh, and actually, those empty trees, those hollow trees, led into the idea, well, okay, I did that, I had three big empty trees. I guess I'm gonna to have to empty out my own trees. And that's when I started, you know, cutting them up and taking the insides out and getting the matched piece one against the other. Uh, so there's all sort of, I mean, that's almost kind of a pseudoscience or analytical is uh, because, you know, how do I make those things? I, I, I make them into such small pieces that I can't even recognize what they are. And then it's, you know, up to me to figure out how to build it back the, the way it came. Uh, and I don't know, I, somehow that it keeps me interested. <laughs> and the rest of us. Um, so, uh, you know, among the other things that have, you know, been part of the culture throughout the course of your, of your career, but shifted, um, you know, one of course is this question of originality and authenticity, what's the, what's the original? You referred to the Michael Rockefeller wing at the Met opening in the early 1980s, and of course there was the primitivism show, primitivism and modern art at, uh, at the Museum of Modern Art in, in the early 80s. And there are so many um, 
affinities, to use the term, you know, that was so thoroughly um, demolished um, in the critical, critical response to that show at, at The Modern, there's so many connections between your work and tribal work. And um, I wonder if you want to talk about how that relationship in your mind has changed. Um, well, I mean, obviously, you know, the word primitive is kind of ridiculous because it's, it's very sophisticated work. It's just that we don't necessarily understand it, we being, you know, white Westerners. But that, that actually is, as I look at the things, you know, from the Rockefeller collection or something, how do you judge importance or, I, I don't even know if that's the right word, uh, but there's one thing that I took away from it which is repair. And I've often thought of my work as the art of repair, uh, although putting things back together again, because uh, you could see in some of that, that work, um, Yoruba or whatever, that, that things have been repaired again and again and again. Now, nothing is clearer to me than that's a very important piece of work, as opposed, there can be beautiful pieces that somebody's probably making you know, last year and selling in front of the Whitney uh, or something, but uh, it, it's, it's like, how do you judge importance? How do you, it helps you look at it if you realize how important it is even to someone else. Uh, and, you know, maybe you can't really recreate the experience, but uh, it, it's, it's something, knowing as little as I do about it, that I have taken away from it. Uh, the fact that if something's repaired again and again and again, it has some value and it needs to be considered. Uh, considered as much or perhaps even more than something that is you know, slickly beautiful right, right from the get-go. And it, it, it's testimony to it, something that's so fundamental to your work, which is to keep working at it, you know, to change yeah. it and then change it some more. Um, I guess my last question before we turn it open to the audience has to do with um, what, it's probably the kind of question that artists hate to answer. Um, so, here's, you know, here, here's a, a fantastic survey of your work. Has it changed what is going to happen or what is happening now in your studio? Has... Um, well, definitely without me, I can't say that I'm doing this because of that, but uh, the, the fact of putting together this show, of putting together the book, uh, made me consider work that I hadn't seen in years. And uh, the good part of that was that I pull things out and I go, huh, that's pretty good. Uh, because lots of times <laughs> the opposite happens. Um, but I was more thinking that I found my previous ideas, I can't get back into my head, but I found them pretty interesting. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, I think my more normal reaction was seeing something that I now view as quite interesting, go, why didn't I stay with that longer? Why didn't I spend more time on that idea? Uh, so I'm sort of, it, it just opens me up to the fact, actually maybe it's not that the work is directing me, but acknowledging what I don't think I did that I should have done or could have done has freed me up to have more faith in anything I'm doing now. Uh, and I, I see that's very positive. Looking forward to what comes, comes next. Um, questions? Or were you really saying, I know there's something in the negative I'm going to work on? 
it's, again, it's kind of a, a material answer uh, because in that particular film I was using, the positive was very pale and not really very interesting. And the negative, like a Polaroid, you know, you treat it, it was kind of a goopy physical thing. Uh, and, and I like that. But you're right in the fact that I could take a picture and, you know, one switch, of, <laughs> flip of something rather than Photoshop, I could make it a negative. Um, but that's not as interesting to me as this physical piece of film that I, de you know, developed and, you know, scanned, uh, you know, to do this. But the, the one thing you, you said is I am extremely interested in the surface of things. And that is, when we're talking about scale, and this is completely different, but you're just reminding me, is that uh, in, I make all this work. I, I, the big pieces, I'm, you know, the concrete pieces is, they are, you know, I don't want to say handmade, but uh, I like the saw cuts. They show where you've been. And uh, it, if it has, a, if it needs screws or bolts to hold it together, you know, I like that. Everything is the scale that it is, and that, and that way it relates to the body. The photographs, of course, that scale is uh, thrown off kilter, and, but that's interesting too, but, it, you know, they, I, I've said that it's much easier to, instead of looking at something you know, like a tree, uh, and you would understand it immediately, but when you do it in the negative, suddenly the interior lights up in a way that, uh, so you see things that you just plain wouldn't see uh, otherwise. Hi. Oh, it's fine. Um, let's see, as an artist, I know that you have certain aha moments, um, either in terms of an idea or technically how you work with material. But I'm wondering if you could just talk specifically about like, one of your bigger or Uh, that, that's a good question. You're certainly right that there are moments like that. I mean, I think that when I uh, started working very small and I realized that I don't have to do that much to make a sculpture. In other words, maybe my work was getting too complicated because everything that I've done small is like, that would be great if that were bigger. I mean, what, you know, because I, I was limited, physically limited, in how I made it and the type of cuts and what I could do. But when you started out saying aha moment, all my recent aha moments were installing this show. <laughs> because, you know, like putting uh, <clears throat> in the first area with uh, Nemo, putting the other black and white wall piece way up on top of the wall, you know, ah, you know, because before it's always been like a painting on a lower level. And that, that was. That was great, and um, you know, and there are a few others. I, I love the theory, the concept that I put all the concrete pieces outdoors, and so I could really use that glass entryway, you know, window, so the, the show starts before you come in the building, out in the field, on the deck there, and then continues right on there in the lobby. Uh, and these were things that, you know, I hadn't seen before. So until I did them, I didn't. It was, it was, aha, that's great. And that, that was fun. So there are quite a few of those within this show, making the show. Sorry. Yeah, I was, I was wondering if you could talk about gravity. <laughs> I noticed in the other pieces you used metal props and other implements that are not wood, and I thought, I loved it actually. It's really interesting. When you're building them, they're not necessarily standing up. Oh, uh, well, the ones you're thinking of, uh, I actually suspended when I built them. Uh, so how they stood was the last stage. Uh, you know, they, I'm talking about the, the black oil pieces that are really just thrown together in the most sort of chaotic way and, you know, attached all different ways. Uh, but then I knew maybe I had to part those, I knew I had to make it stand. So. Uh, either I could do it with the wood that was in the piece or I had to add something. Uh, but the one thing that I think of, and it's come up when I've installed outdoor pieces or thinking about foundations and stuff, all my work 
stands directly on what it's on. In other words, there's no hidden anything. So not to mention my friend Joel Shapiro, but it takes a hell of a lot of structure under the ground to have a figure leaning over like that. So in my mind, what's really going on is totally invisible. So anyway, I like yeah. that opening visible. Um, I don't know what I'm going to make, but that's right off the bat. I don't go, oh, that would make a good something or other, because I don't know what it's going to be. Um, things start with very basic, hey, that's cool, uh, <laughs> that's cool, look at that piece of wood. I think, well, I've got to cut it up because I've got to get it into this truck and take it to New York. Um, you know, and then I get it back, and then, so I'm always dealing with something that I did for another reason. And I think that that's sort of the chain of events through making something, I call it, you know, things done for another reason. So that I may have bolted it together, I may have made uh, dovetail joints that I decide not to use, but it's all, you know, there. And, uh, but the, I don't have any master plan at all. Uh, the difference with using the big trees in there is that the, I, the time frame of making them was very different because the temporal quality, because I had to think about them. They were there, they were around me, they were bugging me, it wasn't right, what am I gonna do? So, uh, you know, they could take really a couple of years of taking up space in my studio before I did something that made them a sculpture for me, that made them feel personal, because they're not personal when I bring them in. I don't know if that answers your questions, so. I'm sorry. Good, thank you. Hi. Hi. Well, um, your use of symbols, I'm not quite sure, because I'm not, I, I definitely, when I prepared the block before I started, some of those pieces, I made the block hollow. Uh, and that's just basically because maybe I didn't have enough wood, or maybe I thought it would be, you know, interesting to cut through and see it that way. Uh, and, uh, but symbols, I think about, you know, what are the symbols of objects, abstract objects? And you know, I mean, mention you know, the primitivism show or something. There, there are things that there sort of like seem to be only so many things you can do. For instance, all that that sawtooth shape that it comes out, which I like, which I use a number of times. Uh, in different parts of the world, it means completely different things. It could mean antlers on a you know some sort of anim animal. So it could be uh, you know uh, what else? Breasts. Oh, so it could you be, know what the symbol means. I, I, but I, I don't work with them. I'm just saying that, I, that there are only so many, you look around and you say, okay, you're gonna make something out of wood. Uh, and you know, before you get into total realism of some sort, uh, you know, what does this mean? Uh, and I just see the you know, preponderance of, uh, you know, I really liked you know, Yoruba masks and the way pigment was put in those. And you know, I'm not copying them, but it's just, I have a saw. 
and the saw cuts this way. <laughs> and uh, and then, then, you know, I see, oh. Well, well. that little one, this, the one that's like um, the triangle with the, the small point, the picture, um, and then the other one, then you can look straight through it. It's almost like you're looking through a camera. But it's that shape, you know, the piece of Yeah, I'm not even particularly sure which piece you're talking about, but it's anyway. The, that's okay. But anyway, yeah. Yes, looking through something, you're always dealing with objects. Is there a front and a back? Uh, and, you know, and basically, I think if a sculpture is successful, there should not be a front and a back. But if there is something that, and I've done this, you know, this is back to, you know, installing a show, is I'd have the, the back, you know, the part that you don't see as much going on. Maybe that's what you should see first when you walk in. So then you discover more walking around it. But um, I don't know, I'm just very conscious of you know, how you know, the change of light and the change, looking through these things. I think we have time for two more questions uh, in the back. Can you tell us about the process of how you do the work on paper? Um, yeah, that's a, it, it would seem that uh, <clears throat> everything I go into, I kind of develop a technique to make it happen. I had not done any paperwork. I got this, uh, you know, fellowship or whatever, Dudane, which is a great place where they, you know, they're a paper mill. And uh, I did not like work that I'd seen with pulp paper. I didn't know if paper mache, pulp paper. I didn't have a particular uh, interest in it, but it took me a long time to get to where I did because they're cool things. You can do, oh, you can do watermarks. So I do watermarks. Well, that's good for Richard Tuttle, but it's a little too subtle for me. <laughs> so I moved on to, you know, making uh, pieces, like came right after the wood blocks, the big wood block. So I had, wood blocks like that, and I thought, well, why don't I cast paper into the wood block? Uh, I did that, but then after waiting a month, the paper wouldn't come out of the wood. It just tore out. So then I had to make rubber molds. So I made rubber molds, and then uh, I, I could then press, put the pigment in the wet rubber mold, put the cooch, the, uh, you know, the unpressed, whatever, you know, the pulp into the, into the mold, uh, and then it would go under the press. They're all, you know, vertical press, a lot of pressure. And all the water would be more or less, you know, squeezed out. And then uh, open it up and see, you know, what, what came out. You're not totally sure. I could control it to a certain degree, but once it goes under the pressure, the water's going to go any way it wants. So you can see that in the pigment, moving the pigment through. So, um, yeah, and then later on, because I started out with rectangles, I realized that, you know, I could actually overlap things. So I started overlapping things. And in, in other words, I, it got very complicated, but then whatever it did, once it went under the press, <laughs> I'd have this image, and that was uh, pretty much it. I'm not sure what, what uh, you know, what else I can say about it, but yes, there were rubber molds, overlapping rubber molds, pigment, put into wet molds, and then the pressure. Uh, I thought this show was great. Thanks so much. And it's great to hear these pieces and these works. One piece, or a group of pieces I found particularly arresting were the mahogany and red paint. I forget the names I taught weeks ago. But could you talk about those? I think they're like seven shorter pieces, um, almost like game pieces. Yeah. Um, well, that, that's, uh, I'd, I'd been, you know, working with the trees and the rough wood, and that's when I got to this idea that I could probably find enough to interest me within a rectilinear block and not rely on responding to what the tree is. Uh, and uh, so those actually came from me fiddling around with much smaller pieces. Like I just said, I'd see smaller pieces that would be, uh, really interesting, uh, but seeing, trying to keep them simple enough. And uh, what I mean by simple is I used to, when I started out cutting into these blocks, and I don't think there are any in this show, but I would pull out the inside of the blocks and then I'd make a sculpture on top, but it would be completely different. 
it wouldn't be exactly the way it came out. But in those red blocks, I thought maybe, you know, I'm trying to be too uh, obscure here. I, why not just take the inside out and put it on top? And that's what I did. And that's, that's how those came about. And yeah, I got, made a bunch of red blocks and I worked that way. So it's what you see. I, I, I think um, what we're looking at here is actually like 40 years of work and so that if I was doing things that were very clear, I'd be more fun to do things that weren't so clear. In other words, like my move to the black oil pieces which came after the pieces on the bases there where you could see everything going on, the black oil pieces, I thought I really want pieces that don't go together. I want them sort of blown together, like a reverse explosion. So I'd make all these little sculptures, cut them up, and these, each piece was interesting to me. And then I'd sort of try to, you know, get them back together. But I sort of think what you're saying is the retrievability of information. Sometimes you can see exactly where something came from. Sometimes you can sense it because you sense the curves, the negative curve. You, you kind of, without even knowing it, there's a cohesion to the work because of this positive negative thing, but you can't put it back together. Uh, and that's just sort of, you know, the, the waves of working different ways at different times. Sometimes it makes more sense, other times it doesn't. Keeping us guessing. Um, <laughs> thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mel.